and a strain sensor for auto Z offset. Okay, so that is something that's completely new that we have not seen before. Breaking news, we've just received word that Creality has released a new Ender 3. I know, that's what everyone wanted was another Ender 3. This one is called the Ender 3 V3 SE. So you know, that alphabet soup that they're using to come up with names has not failed them yet and they're continuing to use it. Let's take a look at everything we know about this new Ender 3 model. The main source of information here is going to be an all 3DP article. I'll link to that in the description below if you want to see their take. That article contains links to a bunch of source documents so we can get clues as to what this new machine might have. It actually looks quite a bit different than Ender 3 models in the past. And if you look closely at this image, you'll notice that these wheels are recessed into the actual frame. So instead of those wheels riding on the very outer surface of this extrusion, it looks like it's sunk in there a good halfway. And to me, this indicates they're using a T-shaped extrusion that's been custom designed for this application. That's going to use less material, less wheels, and just overall reduce the cost of this machine. So that's a very smart move by Creality. Looking towards the base of the machine, you can see what appears to be dual linear rods. So instead of using V-groove wheels down there, they've switched to rods, and there's also no bed leveling screws. So this is designed to be a low maintenance, easy to use machine. Also, the x-axis stepper motor has been moved and the belt orientation has been rotated 90 degrees. So that's going to help make the machine a little bit narrower. And additionally, the belt tensioner on the right-hand side of the machine has been chopped down or removed. So that further helps shrink the profile of this machine. Looking at the interface, it looks like it's using the good old-fashioned knob and wheel interface with a little screen there. And it looks like it comes with an all-new hot end and part cooling setup. You can see the nozzle is kind of poking out here, a little bit to the right of center. This is a welcome change because basically on every single Ender 3 I've ever owned, I've had to upgrade the part cooling. So them moving to a new system hopefully means that you're going to have better part cooling out of the box. Additionally, we have what appears to be a 24-pin cable. So from the Ender 3 S1 onward, we've had this 24-pin cable that's been used to facilitate all the connections from the main board to the hot end. I developed my own breakout board that makes things easier to mod with this cable setup, and we'll have to see if it remains compatible with this new edition of the Ender 3. It looks like we have a little CR touch there poking out, and uh, maybe a nozzle a little bit further forward. This lever arm looks a lot like a sprite extruder the x-axis is riding on v-groove wheels. However, again, it looks like this v-groove wheel on the top is sunken into the frame a little bit more than usual. So there's definitely something going on with the extrusions here. Along the back of the machine, we can see dual Z lead screws, and the stepper motors, instead of sitting up top here, they're actually sunken into the base of the machine. Then we've got our good old spool holder at the top and this belt synchronization system. The top portion appears to be injection molded. We can see the I.O., which is an SD card and a USB-C port. Then we can see the bed cables with a nice strain relief. And funnily enough, on the left-hand side, we can see the stepper motor, but on the right-hand side, we can't see the stepper motor. So that's kind of a funny configuration. Maybe they're only using a single stepper motor, using that top axis to synchronize the two lead screws, or maybe the stepper motor on the right-hand side is sunk into the base of the machine. But overall, it looks like it's taking a lot of design cues from the CRM4 that I reviewed a couple months ago. It's got this kind of armor-looking front piece. Here's the links on their official website. You can see the MSRP of 200 pounds, but it's on a sale price at 190 pounds, which is quite an inexpensive machine. Given that the Ender 3 S1 Pro was around $300, I'm really glad to see this return to form for Creality, offering really low budget machines to people getting into the hobby. I mean, the K1 is nice and all, but at $500 or $600, it's a much more difficult value proposition. According to them, the Ender 3 V3 SE, 3D printing, so easy. Here on the AliExpress listing, we can see a little bit more information. In this picture, we're confirming that we have linear rods and we have a stepper motor on one side. I'm not sure if there's a stepper motor on the other side for that z-axis, but we've got dual axis lead screws. You can see that these are indeed v-groove wheels that are just kind of sunken into the frame further than they would normally be. 
This image confirms that we're using a Sprite extruder. They call everything a Sprite extruder these days, but if they're shipping it with the old Sprite extruder that comes on the Ender 3S1, that would be really nice because I find that to be a very reliable and nice extruder for the job. It's able to push very high flow rates. All right, this picture of the internals of the extruder looks exactly like the Sprite hot end, so I think we're just gonna have the same Sprite hot end from the Ender 3S1 series. Here you can see a bed leveling mesh on that little screen. And uh, here's something new. It says, relax, let auto leveling do it. Leveling is the basis of print quality, which I guess that's kind of true. Ender 3 V3 SE features a CR touch sensor for auto leveling and a strain sensor for auto Z offset. Okay, so that is something that's completely new that we have not seen before. It appears that they have a little strain gauge in the front left corner of the build area. And I assume that's going to be used for automatically calibrating their Z offset. If you look on this printer, you can see we've got our CR touch over here on the right. And that might be mounted slightly higher or lower. And likewise, the nozzle, when you install a nozzle on this printer, might be slightly higher or lower. It might be off by like a millimeter or something. And when you start printing with this machine and you're doing your initial calibration, you have to tell it like what's the exact offset between where the probe triggers and where that nozzle is. Now with the strain gauge, what I'm assuming they're gonna be able to do here is instead of doing their normal bed leveling mesh and then asking you to do the probe offset, they're gonna do the bed leveling mesh and then they can just go back over to this corner, touch the bed and figure out where the BL touch probe triggers and then just slowly drive the Z axis until it touches and pushes on the bed with the nozzle. And that way it'll be able to calculate the probe offset because it can calculate the difference between where the probe triggered and where the nozzle touched the bed. And that's just going to be a really cool feature because that Z probe offset was a uh, very manual and kind of skilled task that if you can eliminate it and just have it do it automatically, that's going to make a new user experience much more enjoyable and much easier. That's going to be slightly different than the load cell system that you see on the K1 and the P1P which have load cells under three points of the bed and they can trigger everywhere on the board. In the Ender 3's application, they're just gonna put one load cell in the bottom left corner that it's gonna use to do that offset and then they're gonna use a traditional CR touch to do the rest of the mesh bed leveling. So that's awesome to see here and uh, we'll just kind of peek around and see if we can find any more hints to what's going on with this machine. It looks like we've got a stepper motor, oh, that's a large diameter pulley gear on that stepper motor. That's like what we're seeing on the K1 and K1 Max. They're using larger diameter pulleys to hopefully give you higher speeds. So they're going for speed with this machine as well as consistent extrusion with this Sprite hot end and uh, worry-free bed leveling that automatically calculates the probe offset. So this is gonna be an exciting entry into the market from Creality. It says it's going to be released on September 30th. I imagine we'll see video reviews on this thing starting sometime next month. I think this is gonna be a return to form by Creality where they're gonna make something that's cheap, moddable, and fun to use. One thing that I was a little bit worried about with the Ender 3 series is that they were going up market in terms of price and features. You had the new Ender 3 S1 and it was in the $300 range. Then you had the S1 Pro and that was in the three to $400 range. And it's like, come on, that's not what the Ender 3 is about. The Ender 3 is supposed to be a cheap machine that's fun to use and you know it's inexpensive enough that you can take parts off of it and really start experimenting with it and learning more about robotics and 3D printing because it's not that big of a risk to damage a $200 printer. For me, I view it as a learning opportunity and if the base price is around $200, then it can't be that expensive to fix if you break it. Compare that to some of the other machines on the market, like the K1 and the P1P and the P1S and the X1C. You really don't want to be messing with those as a novice, because if you break something, you might be out $1,000, which is completely ridiculous. Getting back to low-budget machines that are fun to use, easy to mod, and inexpensive, I mean, I think that's what 3D printing needs these days. This is going to be a very important entry for Creality because there's a lot of bed slingers on the market like this Neptune 4 that are coming out with extremely fast print speeds with tons of features. So this will be kind of Creality fighting back and they're going to have to undercut these competitors on cost. I'm predicting that this printer is going to be around $200. It might be even less than $200 on the initial pre-sale. So keep an eye out for that. Let's go through some of the other information here on this AliExpress link. We've got a lot of good information here, so let's keep reading. Worry-free auto-leveling, auto-Z offset sensor, that's gonna be awesome. 
Faster print speeds. It can print as fast as 250 millimeters per second while keeping print quality. That'll be awesome to see. Um, given the type of screen they're using, I think they're going to be sticking with Marlin. Marlin has an implementation of input shaper now, so they might be using a Marlin based input shaper on this printer. That'll be really exciting to see. Um, again, it says capable Sprite direct drive extruder. I really like that extruder. I've been able to push it to 75 cubic millimeters per second, which is absolutely crazy for those high flow applications. Stable dual axis Z, Y axis dual linear shafts. Okay, yep, we confirm that here. It says one tap to load the filament and one tap to unload it. That's just a firmware feature. That's nothing new or too crazy. Intuitive UI display, so optimizes UI display for leveling process and parameters settings at a glance. Again, that's another meaningless entry on this little list of features. Compact and sleek design, smaller to place around, but still offers ample build volume. So yeah, I mean, by reducing the width of this whole x-axis gantry assembly, they're reducing cost, and they're also going to make it easier to set on your desk or whatever. Now the base of the machine appeared to be injection molded. I imagine they're just going to injection mold the whole bottom in one shot to help keep costs down. So yeah, the absence of those bed leveling knobs, the automatic strain gauge, Z-probe offset, those are all going to be awesome features and I'm really excited to see what they come out with. And then we have a list of features here. So it's an FDM printer, of course. Build volume of 220 by 220 by 250 That's pretty similar to what we've seen on our previous Ender 3s. Uh, it's actually exactly the same. It's nothing exciting at all. The product dimensions are listed here. Um, I imagine it's slightly narrower than what we have on the Ender 3 V2. Also, it might be a little bit narrower front to back because the tensioning mechanism and stepper motor are kind of integrated into the base, so you won't have stuff sticking out the front like they have on this machine. Net weight, 6.5 kilograms. Typical printing speed, 180 millimeters per second, and max printing speed, 250 millimeters per second. So with my K1 and other similar printers that are geared for high speed printing, they claim crazy stuff like 500 millimeters per second, but really you only see that on travel moves where it's moving across the bed and it has plenty of time to accelerate and decelerate. Realistically, when I'm printing with my K1 or my P1Ps or my P1S, um, the print speeds tend to be in the 150 to 250 millimeters per second range. But if your typical print speeds are 180 millimeters per second, that's still really good. We'll have to test that out once we get one in for review. Accelerations, 2,500 millimeters per second. You can probably push that up to 5,000 and have decent results. But 2,500 is still respectable. Uh, printing accuracy, layer height, uh, all this stuff, you know, doesn't really matter. They're using a polycarbonate spring steel sheet. If that's the same one that they ship on the CRM4, then that'll be really nice. I really like the print surface on the CRM4 and find it to be much better than any of the polycarbonate sheets I've used in the past. I mean, really, this thing is shaping up to be a miniature CRM4. It's got the same looks, it's got a lot of the same features, but it's just shrunk down in size and massively reduced in price. It says the nozzle temperature is 260 degrees Celsius, so that's indicating that we probably have a PTFE-lined hot end, which is a little unfortunate, but I guess they have to leave room for upgrades for the Pro Edition. That means you're probably going to be sticking with PLA and PETG. However, it's a pretty easy upgrade to change out the heat break on those things. You can buy an aftermarket all-metal heat break on Amazon for like $8 to $12. So that'll be a really easy upgrade to install on your machine. The reason why they're using a PTFE-lined hot end is usually to make things noob-friendly. You can crash the hot end a little bit more and it won't damage itself as easily. But with an all metal hot end, that's kind of a fragile piece. So they're just trying to balance the needs of beginners and people who are more advanced users. All right, so um, check the links in the description below. I'll leave links to the articles and the uh, AliExpress listings and stuff that I got information from. Also, remember to click all of the affiliate links so I get credit for anything that you buy in the future. And I'll see you in the next episode.